I am Dr. Ramesh Sharma, Director of Institute of Business and Continuing Education at the University of Guyana. Professor Fred Blockwood is no new name. He is a world-renowned figure in the field of distance education. He has been uh, Emeritus Professor at uh, Metropolitan Manchester University, United Kingdom. He has been uh, associated with Institute of Education Technology with the United Kingdom Open University, which is a very big institution in terms of uh, being the first open university in the world. He has been the series editor for the uh, Rootley Publishers. So, uh, I present to you Professor Fred Lockwood. So, after uh, working for over four decades in the field of open distance and flexible learning, how do you feel the distance education is evolving or changing over a period of time? I would say the major change has been mainstreaming distance education. Uh, Forty years ago, when the British Open University was established, it was really quite novel, and there was some doubt as to whether the British Open University would survive. In fact, the, uh, the Conservative government at that time, the Margaret Thatcher, really had serious doubts, and they thought that the university as an idea, as an experiment, may end. Forty years later, the Open University is still in place, it's thriving, it has probably a quarter of a million students, and that sounds a great success, and it is. But in terms of an international perspective, wow, uh, things changed over the last 40 years. Uh, it's interesting that we first met at the Indira Gandhi National Open University in New Delhi. Yes. Uh, every time I go to Ipni, I'm told that the university continue, continues to expand in size. I think it's now 1.5 million students at Italy, and that's one of 13, 14, 15 open universities in India. Uh, a mutual friend of ours, Paul Kalanchi, at the Open University of China, was telling me they have 3.4 million students. Now, okay, they are two of the mega universities in the world, but look around the world. The Open University of Nigeria, Open University of the Philippines. There are new open universities developing everywhere. So what has been one of the main changes over the last 40 years? I would say, yes, it's become mainstream. It's no longer that model. There are about 150 universities in the UK. And I would say every one of those is offering some course through a distance and open or a flexible method, uh, just as we are here at the University of Ghana. So one of the main differences, yes, mainstream is now becoming commonplace. Uh, how these trends they are happening in a, a positive and negative of that? The major change I think within the the Routledge series, the Open Distance and Flexible Learning series, is the way that the emphasis has changed. That series was launched in 1992, and the, the content of the books at that time was really quite conventional, conventional educational technology type books. Over the last 12 years or so, last 18 years or so, the emphasis has changed. It's now almost the case, almost, that every book we produce has some aspect of e-learning, online learning, mobile learning. That seems to be the major thrust at the present time. Um, for me, that's fantastic. It's using a medium that's incredibly powerful and that can do things that print finds really quite difficult. Interaction between students interaction between the tutor and the student. That is not impossible in a text-based uh, system using email, using the phone, actually writing. But that internet connection has transformed the way that we're teaching. So if there's been a major change, 
I would say it's that using those different movements. Some of the, the basic principles that were used 40 years ago at the British Open University and now used generally around the world. Those key principles about who are the audience, what do we know about the audience, how can we gear our teaching best to them, what are the aims we're trying to achieve, what are the objectives we're trying to achieve, what's the most appropriate medium, how are we going to assess these students, those yeah. basic, basic questions. There's been a lot of work over the years done, a lot of research, a lot of publications. And what I see, as a grumpy old man, is that many of the new academics entering the field almost, almost seem to be oblivious about research. And I find that really quite sad and disappointing. What do you think, where it will have its greatest uh, impact in the future? Where I think those ideas, those concepts for teaching at a distance, teaching flexible, uh, exploiting the new technologies. Actually, where I think the greatest advances are taking place are not in universities. Sure, advances have been made, but not in universities. Um, when you compare it to what's happening in industry, commerce, or public services, wherever I look outside universities, incredibly innovative work has been done. Uh, let me think for a moment about the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the largest employers in the United Kingdom is the National Health Service. It employs millions of staff. And how do they train, retrain their staff? And this is from senior medical staff, uh, nurses, administrators. They train them using flexible learning online materials. That's how they train their staff. Uh, work I've done with the police force, uh, the tax office, who I pay my taxes to. Um, I won't mention their name, but a major pharmaceutical company, and we're talking a billion dollar company. How do they train and retrain their staff? What they used to do was hire a hotel for a week and bring their staff from all over the world into this hotel to train them. They don't do that anymore. They send a training to to their representatives all over the world. So if, if I wanted to try and find innovative ways of using flexible distance online materials, really innovative ways, I think my first call would be to be the police force mm -hmm. in my revenue, uh, Volvo cars who train their staff using self-instruction methods. Uh, it would be that sort of industry commerce link. And that's where a lot of innovative work is being done. So, how do you see it uh, if we want to see the position of distance education uh, in the developing world and uh, developed world? One of the big advantages that a developed country has is sheer number of people. So, I look at the UK. 60 million people. It's not the largest country in the world, but it's a, a substantial country. That's a population that you can draw upon for your courses, to, to sell your courses to. Uh, in India, massive population. China, massive population. So what I see a major problem in a developing country, sometimes they're relatively small countries, relatively small. The way that open universities around the world have been so successful is sheer economy of scale. Yes. So the British Open University, quarter of a million students, offers a very restrictive range of courses. Uh, a very restrictive range. I think many developing countries need to be very, very careful about the range of courses that they offer. Uh, and let me just give you a pointer. The University of Manchester is a prestigious, well-renowned university. But it made a decision a few years ago that it would not teach physics. Okay, okay. This is amazing. Why? Because there are lots of other places that teach physics. If you want to study physics, go elsewhere, because we do not offer that course. Yes. Now, it may mean that the University of Guyana and other similar universities 
offer a very limited range. You have to have many priorities. But it means those courses will be large courses. Economically, they are very, very sound, rather than a whole raft of courses. The five students here, two students there. That bankrupts the institution potential. So that's a potential threat to it. How do you think that uh, simply making a course available online, does it serve any good to the institution or to the students or to the distance education as a whole? This naive belief that I put my lecture notes, my PowerPoint, uh, online and suddenly I'm teaching at a distance. That is not the case. Uh, in some cases, that's a total misuse of the medium. Okay. And so I'll be asking those individuals to focus specifically on what is the most appropriate medium. And I go back to the audience. Who are your audience? Yes. And I usually think of uh, my former friend and colleague, or well, still friend, colleague, uh, Tony Bates, and his actions model. Uh, you know, the word actions, A for access. Yes. What access do your learners have to that medium? Now, if you tell me that 100% of the students have online access, fine, that's a tick. Yeah. But if only 80% have access to the internet, what about the other 20%? Yes. They don't have any access. They're barred. They yeah. cannot do the course. Are you happy with that situation? What about 75%, 85%? So for me, A for access is important. Yes. C for cost in Tony's uh, model. What I notice more and more and more are these courses are going online and putting the cost onto the student. So I fear that many institutions are jumping on this open, distance, flexible e learning bandwagon, uh, saying all our resources are available online if you can afford them and if you want to just study the screen so I'm a bit concerned at the end uh, I would like to have your advice to the emerging distance education systems if some institute is thinking of uh, having distance education uh, to serve to the students in their area what would you like to advise them I think the first thing I would advise is Find out who your students are. How many are there? Is this course going to be viable? You can put a lot of time and effort and money into a course, but you've only got 20 students in the entire country or around the world. The course probably isn't viable. Yeah, so the course needs to be viable. And then, I'm afraid, to me, it's those basic questions, like, right? What are you trying to do in the course? What are the students? Uh, how will the students be supported? How are they going to be assessed? What different media are they going to be used? Um, it's that array of elements that make up any teaching process, whether it's online or conventional. Yeah, Professor Fred Lockwood, you uh, heard his opinion, view, view from from the future and the past and where the current distance education stands as of now in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.